All right, this is the Connected Film Festival and New Media Frontiers Panel 2.0, a, a, a holdover from last year, which was just the regular New Media Frontiers panel. And Alfonso Robinson from Hat City Blog is the, uh, the only repeat guest. Basically, it's about different types of writers and new media. So this year we have a musician who takes music from old media and creates new media out of it. Colin Holgate uh, from FunnyGarbage.com out of New York City, who's a writer of various programs and uses flash animation tools. Uh, Alfonso Robinson, who's a blogger with uh, Hat City Blog and My Left Nutmeg Dan from Danbury. Roger Roo from many things, but especially uh, Clickable.tv, which is, uh, shows how to make in new, uh, revenue streams for films uh, using uh, interactive video. And moderator Rick Hancock. Um, good afternoon. I'm glad we finally found a, found a home. But um, you know, the, the term, you know, I'm always intrigued having conversations, uh, and, and all of you expertise in a lot of different areas that all kind of combined, but this term new media, we've been using it for a long time. Is it, is it what we do, or what you guys do, still new? Is there another term, and why do we have such a difficult time explaining to lay folks this term now? Have a go, yeah. Um, I was thinking about this when you said it earlier on, and it seems to me it's like when the same technology reaches a new platform, and it's new media again. And so what we're doing now, like take broadband about a year or two years ago, it finally caught up with a single speed CD-ROM drive. So I've been doing this new media stuff for 20 years. And now finally, uh, on broadband, you can do the things I was doing you know, uh, 18 years ago. And so if you start doing the same things now on, on a cell phone, it's, it's kind of new. It's new media, but it's now new me media but on a cell phone. So I don't know if that's a uh, good judge on, but the, uh, the platform here on makes a difference. Well, in, in terms of blogging, I, I guess it's, it's kind of difficult to, to say well, new media is still new media. I mean, you know, uh, 2006 when I was following the, the Lieberman Lamont campaign, blogging was definitely the new media. Um, we were the only people out there. I had a site called Connecticut Blog, and there was My Left Nutmeg, and we were out there. Space was another great site, Connecticut Local Politics. We were following the, the campaigns in a way that was not done before in Connecticut. But now, um, at least, we, we, let's leap ahead to 2010, you have a lot of blogs out there, and many of these quote-unquote bloggers are actually just paid people from certain newspapers, like the Hearst newspapers have a, a series of bloggers. Uh, can, Hartford Current has a, a series of bloggers who are actually journalists as well. So I guess the new media keeps evolving. I mean, the new media that we thought of four years ago isn't necessarily the new media that we have now. 2006, you had blogs. 2010, it's all about Facebook and Twittering and getting out there and using your iPhone to new stream events. You didn't have that as, as available four years ago. So I think the term new media just keeps evolving with the time. It's like, I guess you would say, what we consider alternative music right now is quite different than alternative music, you know, 10, 20 years ago. So, Rogers, does that mean it depends on where you are? Because there are a lot of people who haven't caught up or just catching up to blogging. You brought in the reference of mainstream legacy media who are very resistant to a lot of the stuff, and now they're trying to morph a lot of this into what they're doing. So does it depend Does it depend on where you are in that, in that process right now? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the term new media is kind of, I mean, I personally don't really like it. I mean, I, I, because what I, I think of new media is like new ways to, you know, in this instance, tell stories or to, to get information. And what I think is like the most annoying thing is, you know, getting Netflix now on your iPad, that's really cool. But we've only changed the way that we get that information. We haven't changed the information at all. You know, and, and I think we're, we're missing out on a lot of, the, uh, the the things that you know these new tools offer, like location, like you know the, the entire internet, the entire world's knowledge in one place, uh, you know, and all of the great things that these tools offer. We're just basically taking old media and sticking on a new device and calling it new media. Right. For the folks that want to label, and I think that was the broader point that I was trying to make. I think the people that are putting labels on this are those from what I, I define legacy media, newspapers, television terrestrial radio, uh, folks are trying to morph what's happening into what into the containers that they have now, more from, from a commodity standpoint, to try to make money off of it, than 
to understand the evolution. If, right. if it was up to them, because I still work in legacy media, they would like to put a big stop sign up and say, enough. I mean, just to, just to build on that point, I think one of the issues, though, with kind of the new media is it comes down to dollars and cents at the end of the day. And, you know, there's this whole long tail concept with new media where now, you know, the, the amount of money that you would make if you had 10 channels is the same as if, you know, 10 channels with a big audience is the same as, you know, 1,000 channels with a smaller audience. Well, to manage 1,000 channels is much harder than to manage 10 channels. So majority of the dollars and cents are still in kind of traditional media just because, and, and again, these guys, you know, the, the, not you in particular, but, you know, the, the establishment wants to keep it that way because at the end of the day, it's easier. Right. And, and moving the long tail, great, great segue. I mean, some people aren't. Most, I can't imagine, well, you, of my profile, look at all you guys. So you have the most potential at this particular moment of making some money off of what you're doing. But the long, for bloggers, it's not about money. It's not, I mean, and so this media, this new media, this new technology has opened up avenues of distribution that we've never had, we've never had before. And I think that speaks to that long tail theory that you're, that you're talking about. And I think that's what drives a lot of, you can disagree, drives a lot of us moving along. And I think one of the things about new media, I think it depends on who you're talking to, what new media is. But for me, for instance, new media is me providing new content as a user as opposed to getting your information from a corporation like Curtis newspaper or the current or the New Haven Register. One of the big things, especially in Danbury, that frustrated a lot of residents that they're not covering enough local coverage, local media, lo local, local government. I went out there and started covering the events, videotaping, giving them commentary about what's happening in, in, in Danbury. Uh, on a statewide level in 2006, one of the biggest things that annoyed people was that it, the, the media was being, the, the information was being controlled by a certain outlet, so people went out and, contr and contributed and covered the news. It was people powered media, is what we used to call it back then. And I think that's what new media is all about. We control the content, we give people an alternative to content versus the corporations. So either you can listen to, you know, I don't know, Hot 97 or Hot 93.7, or you can go on your iPod. Put, put on Pandora, Pandora and just screw on down the street right. and not listen right. to that stuff. You control what you want to listen to. I think that's what we're lo losing a little bit in the media. It wasn't necessarily supposed to be about making cash. It was about giving people an alternative to the cash cow. Okay, but I, I think it was, I forgot, I think it was your email. You were probably said you wanted to talk about some of the development, some things going on with Apple. I, yeah. that's your, so let's, let's move into that area right now of why people do what they do, not expecting a lot of maybe compensation, more getting the notoriety of knowledge, being smart in a particular area, sharing that with other people. With what, say, what's going on with, say, net neutrality, um, Apple's fight with, with uh, the macromedia folks, the, the Adobe folks, you know, trying to get Flash on the platforms. It, people are now trying to make money off of, this, off, off of what's happening. So let's talk about your, the, the, the argument we all have at least one, most of us have at least one Apple product mm -hmm. in our technology, you know, toolbox, you know. Um, I wanted to talk about that for a sec, because I think that ties in with the innovation that we are looking to, to the Apple, to the Googles, and even Microsoft, and some of the other players that are trying to emerge. Yeah, there's, there's two things, two aspects to what you're talking about there. One is the, the earning money, and uh, with the changes that Apple seems to be imposing, it looks like uh, you'll only be able to have advertising on an iPhone or an iPad if it's an iApp. So all of the other advertisers won't be allowed to be on these devices. And why is that? What's wrong with it? Is, is their toy? Oh, no, I, I, they, I'm a capitalist. Yeah. I'm happy for them. Um, but that's just the, uh, the making money side of it and what they're doing affects how other people could have made money. The other side is the more artistic side, which is a lot of people who want to create content for the iPhone and the iPad, they're, they're artists, they're not engineers. And uh, I, I'm, I'm an engineer, I'm not an artist, but between us, we, we produce something which is neat. Um, with Apple's changes, you will only be able to use Apple tools. And the Apple tools are Objective-C and C++ and, right. and so on. Uh, I mean, they say you can use JavaScript, but only within WebKit, which is Apple software again. So you cannot use any of the more creative tools that there are, such as Flash, 
and that's only one of them. There are about 10 different tools that people are using currently with probably maybe 500 titles in the App Store made with these tools that are doing very well. Steve Jobs, for example, has demonstrated uh, tap tap right. revenge stuff. Yeah. That, that, under the new rules, that should be illegal. But let me ask you a question. But okay, that's fine. But you know, Apple has always been that way. And there, you have other platforms that are very open. So right. if you don't want to play by Apple's rules, you can go to Android. You can go to, I mean, so, I mean, that's not trying to be, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an unabashed Apple fanboy. So, yeah. I mean, I'm sitting here to defend Steve, he should hire me and pay me for, <laughs> for, for being a mouthpiece. But it just seems to me, as someone who's been an Apple owner of a, since 1984, no one cared about Apple products. You, they, you're, you're a late camera. Uh, yeah, okay, when did you? In 1980. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. but, but as a capitalist, yes, I'll produce stuff for Android, because I'll happily right. make money off people who buy Androids. Right. I'm not going to buy an Android, though. So for me, personally, and for everybody I know, I'd rather have an iPhone or an iPad than an Android. Yeah. I think artists should be allowed to produce stuff for it. But one of the things, just, I mean, if you, if you look at the evolution of kind of mobile apps, right, it really took off with the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And if you think about why it didn't happen before that. Nothing really changed technologically, like in the prior years from, you know, when you had a little flip phone with Motorola razors. The, the only, the, the big issue was who was controlling some of these apps, right? It was Verizon, it was, it was AT&T, it was Sprint. So you wanted to create an app, you had to go through this huge bureaucracy with Verizon, and then there was a million different screen sizes. And so what ended up happening is, let's say your budget to make an app is 100K. Well, only 20K of that could be really put towards making the app. The rest of the 80K was, okay, you got a bigger screen, now we've got to go to ADT, now we've got to go to this guy. The rest of it, the money was really to port it to other places. Now, if Apple you know, decided to close off their walls, we've basically just rewound innovation to 2000, where now I've got to create an iPhone app, and it's another pain in the butt, and I've got to hire an Objective-C guy, then I've got to do an Android one, and, and it slows everything down. And I think that was the beauty of Flash, which was it worked across all browsers. It didn't work that great, sure, there's some problems with it, but it worked. And with that, we saw all these new innovations coming about because we didn't have to worry about, now I gotta do something for IE, here it comes again, you know? Well, what about, okay, well, we're talking about on the back end. What about the consumer? What, what are the, what's the consumer one? I think, you know, is the consumer demanding, what's the consumer demanding? I don't know. Well, I, I think consumer demands that iPad, I think they demand this iPhone, I think there is, you know, for somebody who's been around since playing computer since the Apple IIe, they want Mac. They don't want to be sitting around, taking around with a PC and get a blue screen in a second. They don't want to worry about the operating system. They want it fast, easy, and microwave. That's why the iPhone and the iPad are so successful and why netbooks basically suck. Um, you know, that's why Apple's so, so popular. You don't have to worry about the operating system. You just, you have an app, you just click a button and boom, and it's, it's, it's on. The problem with Apple is that they're so restrictive in their applicants, applications that nowadays, like me, and I'll say it, this is jailbroken. You know, I have to jailbreak my phone to put other type of apps on there that I want, but, but Apple's refusing for me to, you know, have on my system. I think that's a problem. Um, but to your thing about different platforms and stuff, we, we've always been doing different platforms. Somebody in publishing, I can tell you right now, you support Express, Photoshop, Illustrator on the PC and on the Mac. Those are two completely different operating systems. They're more closely related now than they were back then with the Intel chips. But they're, I mean, that's that's always been um, that's always been a, a thing. But I think now they what consumers want they want something as simple as possible with the less headaches. And that's that's why I think iPhones and iPads are the way of the future. To heard Justin even uh, to yeah. to to this um, actually the other day uh, one of my many hats I'm <coughs> teach up at UConn social media, and uh, this final project when the students raised an incredible number of illegal downloads of uh, music. I mean, I asked them, I, it's a common question journalism professors ask students, how many of you still read newspapers? We don't even ask that question. The better question, when's the last time you bought music? You're asking me that No, I'm not, yeah. just, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, but I mean, just the, the, the way music has evolved, how yeah. are people making money these days, and can the music industry survive, and, and how are they surviving? Yeah, well, I've chosen for the purpose of this discussion to take the role of the ludite, someone who is afraid of new technology, um, just to provide a contrarian uh, viewpoint. Um, 
I just wanted to say, uh, you know, one of the trends that I see that's coming with uh, new media is this movement away from letting the user tinker with things. Like you're talking about Apple, you know, locking out um, programmers. I mean, well, just even just the basic users of, of wanting to go in and, and tinker stuff and add stuff. You had to jailbreak your thing. Um, so that's. I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. That's sort of a, a worrying trend. I I I think that uh, you know. It's only been the past, I don't know, where it started, but you know, certainly 30, 40 years ago, anybody could open up their TV and start and make repairs, and now you have to, uh, you know, I'm sort of getting away from your uh, your question, though. Uh, how do, uh, you know, your question was how do uh, you just look still at the, make music Yeah, the music and, and digital platforms, and, you know, I, I um, know folks, and even my, my oldest son, you know, he, Gets music before I think the musicians even know for yeah. music. You know, it's quite, how fast. I, mean, I think I think the number that one of my students put 45 billion illegal downloads. 45 yeah. Billion. Well, depending on whose perspective is illegal, you know, well, term of, but 45 billion non-paid for yeah. downloads. Regardless of, of legality, if you <laughs> if you can think of it, you can get it. Okay. Just if you have a connection to the internet, you can get it. And. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's kind of over, kind of overwhelming because, like, even just I remember, remember record stores. I remember going in there and uh, you know being overwhelmed by the selection there. Like, oh, what was, what did I need to, to buy? I can't even remember. Well, it's just that long tail theory as well. You know, you can get anything of any category anywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, musicians have had to adapt uh, in, to you know adapt to the consumer uh, demand. Nobody buys albums anymore. People buy songs. And you know, you used to think of the album as a uh, you know something in two acts. It was a you know a 12-inch disc, and you had to be played one act, right, for maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then there was an intermission. You, you got up, you had to walk over, flip it for the second act. And so people wrote their albums with that in mind. They you know the, the, the first half kind of was a piece of its own with a start and an end, and then flipped over the second half, that was another start. And people don't write music that way anymore. And uh, everything's like super compressed because it's gotta sound good on radio. It's gotta sound good like any little, uh, you know, and you, 10 second preview has to you sound You don't seem to like that. Are you blaming technology and, and speed not, well, distribution? I'm, uh, you know, I'm trying to take the contrarian view here, but I mean, I can't, I can't, you can't avoid that. And so, I mean, I've had this discussion with other, you know, music purists that have, lamented this, but you know, technology is a double-edged sword usually it always brings something good with bad. And I like the fact that I can just go and get anything I want by connecting to the internet. You know, I, I lament the passing of the old the ways that we used to listen to albums. And I still listen to albums. I still have a record player and I probably listen to that more than I listen to a rotary phone at home too. <laughs> uh, no, I don't have one currently. I have a beta VHS yes. player. Uh, beta, uh, but that's good. Well, you know what? You, you raise a good point, though. You know, if you look at the beta format, mm -hmm. that was much better than VHS. It is. Absolutely. You it know, is. I mean, from a quality standpoint. Yeah. I mean, and, and what, it's what just one the marketing thing. The mar and the cost, it was cheaper. You to, may not know this, but there, there was a third format at the time, which was better still, the uh, beta. Uh, it was a video 2000 or something like that. It's, um, Grundig and other companies had that format. It was a, it was a bigger tape. Uh, it was kind of like having three quarter inch videotape virtually. And it, it was better, but it was more complex mechanics. So I think it failed, yeah. not because of the amount of uh, material available for VHS, but mechanically it was doomed. It was interesting that the worst of the three formats was the one that survived. Right. Well, that was because yeah. the porn industry decided that's the way it was done. I was going to say. I mean, they, Sony. They, they, they decided that's the way it was done. Not, I didn't well, no, Sony, no, Sony, <laughs> Sony was Betamax. Sony well, didn't. yeah, they embraced porn. Oh, no, they, they uh, didn't want porn on their... I don't know if that was the reason. Oh, uh, maybe. And so that's so they... Uh, yeah. that was what, you can't deny that. Uh, so the, the, market the iPhone's thing as well, then. By that logic, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Well, you know when Steve Jobs said recently that uh, Android's well, poor, right. I thought there must have been a huge spike in the Android yeah, sales, sales. That day. <laughs> well, I mean, you can put anything on it. I mean, you can, you have to go through extra steps. You can put anything on your iPhone. I mean, you can put right. anything. You jailbroke or not, you can put anything on your iPhone. I was going to, you know, take the point that you said before about kind of how musicians make money, and then the, the previous point, which is, you know, as a blogger, 
how a lot of people do it for the love. But I think nowadays, you know, what what you see is, I mean, do you guys remember that movie, uh, Sandra Bullock in the Net, you know, where she got erased? <laughs> right, 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 right. Imagine you met somebody today and, you know, hi, I'm Joe Smith or whatever, and you Google them and there's nothing, right? And I think what what bloggers and musicians have in common is they're giving away something to get more in return, right? So so a lot of these 360 deals now that record labels are trying to put together because they realize the bigger money isn't in selling the music, it's in live performance, it's in licensing, merchandising, you know, et cetera, et cetera. For bloggers, it's it's about being that thought leader. So, you know, you know your SHIT in political stuff in Danbury. Well, you know what? We need a guy that knows that, and we're going to create a show around it. Now, you know, in terms of sponsorship dollars, that's way more ba that you get back in terms of you know what you're putting in. So, I think that's kind of the new model, which is giving to get, as opposed to just getting, 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 getting. And let's not let's let's not forget something here. All these illegal downloads. I'm quite certain there's sort of some artists out there who, who put out their stuff on their own. I mean, yeah, some yeah. artists put out their stuff in advance to get it legally downloaded, so when it comes out, they get a big right. revenue and a big spike in their sales. Uh, Eminem, um, T.I., uh, Lil Wayne, those artists who they leak their stuff out. There's no way they could And then there's stuff out. The, the Radiohead example where, hey, just pay us something, yeah. and people pay. pay. Right. Right. Yeah. Same thing with the music industry. I mean, there, there are a lot of people, a lot of movies, again, torrents and pick up stuff and you know you create that buzz. Uh, was paranormal activity through whole social media. I mean that people were buzzing about that a year before it even came out and, and that whole viral nature. And I think you had a studio that one at least in that example, you know, recognized the power of that where they paid zero dollars in marketing. Zero and made millions of dollars. Snakes on the Plane is another good example of a movie that was just atrocious, but the marketing was not so well that they made a lot of money off of something that caused relatively nothing. Blair Witch. I've, I've seen Blair that too. Yeah. Well, that's the viral uh, quality of the net, but you can't, I don't think you can really purposely make something viral. Sometimes sometimes it has to sort of catch on its own. We're Nine Inch, Inch Nails. I'm sorry, Nine Inch Nails actually put out a, 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 an album, and it was in a Creative Commons attribution. Right. So that's another example. We we do have an audience here. So you know, anytime <laughs> oh. you know, no, we do have no. Seriously, we have an audience. So anytime you want to interject, this is supposed to be an interactive uh, experience. Um, and uh, if you have any thoughts, comments, suggestions, just don't throw stuff. You know, so don't throw stuff I was just going to throw something you know out to the, the panel, which is I think it's kind of interesting that you know nowadays you have to think a little bit, right? Like, hey, I want to get that song, and you go to iTunes because it's kind of this cost benefit where I could rip it off but it's kind of a pain and I might get a virus blah blah you know it's a dollar right go get it but now people are like thinking oh man it's a dollar or you know hey I want to see the newest episode of Lost it's a dollar nine nine on iTunes uh, but on the flip side of that I'll send, I'll give you a Facebook rose for a dollar right. no questions right. asked or I'll go buy some That's Zanga currency right. in Farmville oh, no problem but, 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 but I think but, but going to that point that's a great that's an excellent point that you raised uh, I don't know if that psychology moves to the mobile device as much. We've all in agreement, no one's paying for news on that laptop. Right. Mm -hmm. A lot of my apps on this and on my phone, I pay for. Right. Because you know what? I, I love this thing. Yeah. You know, it needs stuff. And so it needs apps. It needs apps. And if I have to pay for my ESPN app, my, my news app, my Wall Street Journal, I'm more willing to pay for that because there's a value. And the news media, they lost sight of that, I think, initially, that they do have stuff. And the music industry, they do have stuff, but you have to package it in a way that is of value. And, and I, I think that they lost out. And so trying to go back, you know, revisit that, uh, is, I think is a mistake. I, I feel very strongly about that, but if anyone disagrees. They, a great example is back in the 90s when, when the music industry, and they're, they're complete, I, I knew when they did it, I was like, they're gonna, they're gonna collapse. When they challenged Napster, they went after Napster, they went after after people who down with students, three. students students in colleges. Yeah. I'm like, people, this is a cash cow here. Find a way to get your stuff on the internet and sell it in a way that you can make money. Now you have iTunes, Steve Jobs, of course there's something with that I don't want to pay a dollar, but you go and see how many people are buying like when Michael Jackson passed away, right. Steve Jobs made a lot of money. <laughs> you know, and people are making a lot of money. Apple's making a lot of money. Marketing 
iTunes and making people, allowing people to purchase their music that way. Now people don't buy albums, they buy singles. And where do they buy singles? Right. Most of the time through iTunes. And this is where the, the music industry really dropped the ball back then. And I think they're dropping the ball now with new media, mm -hmm. like the, the New York Times and Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. and, and media outlets such as that. They should charge people a little bit for content on an iPad. And I'm telling you, the iPad five years from now, I will not have this thing. Right. I'm going to have that. And, and everything's going to be going through that, whether it's eBooks, ESPN, um, live streaming of yeah. all my networks on there in real time. They should learn how to make people market it so that you pay for your kind of that way, and that's going to solve a lot of yeah. problems. Get rid of cable. Well, get rid of it. The, the monopoly <laughs> cable is yeah. outrageous. Uh, the yeah. display is actually yeah. downstairs. I, I uh, got to see for the first time, really, it, and you were saying the display function of the iPad. And you know, I mean, you can take your media, take your media with with you, and, and it seems uh, the way to way to go. Um, I was going to say. I think it's hard to get people to pay for content, and I, anywhere or anywhere. Just, just in general, as, I, I, as much as I hate advertising, I think that's probably where the, the revenue is for these things. Like if you look at sites like Hulu, where they put they are they stream you the episode, and nine times out of ten, it's a it's a clean stream. You don't have to wait for it to buffer, and it's like it works better than the other ones. But they give you advertising. I I, bought, I buy seasons of iTunes. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I have watched 24 to about the sixth series, and I watched all the previous series on iTunes. Yeah, if you, and this, you can see 24 in 24 minutes. You know, it's, there's no commercials. Yeah. So it's 42 40, 40 is for you. 40, 42. But, but I think it's also about conditioning. I mean, I, th I think we've all been conditioned that these external devices are something you pay for, right? So, like, on Wii, I'll pay, you know, nine, uh, I think it was five bucks to get a browser on Wii. And somebody's like, you bought a web browser? You know, and it's like, yeah, but it was on the Wii. Right. And I think we're more we're more willing to pay for stuff that's on our devices because that's just the way it is. Versus music, oh yeah, music that's free. You know, and now we've been conditioned to expect all this stuff to be free. Um, and then to the point of content, I think I think at some point we're going to need people to pay for content. There's just not enough advertising inventory to go around. You know, and and you kind of saw it with free TV, and then there became HBO. And people are willing to pay for that, but I think it needs to be similar to like iTunes and some of these other things where, you know, when you get an app on iTunes, it kind of asks you a couple of times, are you sure you want to get this app? Are you sure you want to get this app? What they're really asking is, we have your credit card, we're going to ping your credit card. Are you sure, really sure you want us to do that? But with the, with the questions they ask, it's, it's almost like you don't really realize it. I mean, we were talking before about Netflix. I mean, I, I have some DVDs at my house prior cost me 50 bucks because they're just sitting there. I haven't watched them in three months, you know, but they're free because it's 15 bucks a month, all you can eat, not thinking about it, like cable, right? Probably paying 100 bucks a month, three bucks a day, but it's free. It's always there. So something to think about for like the, the newspapers too is if you charge people per story, even if it's a penny, a nickel, a dime, you, you think you, in your brain, you're like, I'm paying for this. Eek. You know, if it's a penny, it's like, just give it to me, man. You know, it's a penny. And it's too much. It's like, oh, God. Because, well, there's the price of it, but then there's also the transaction, which right. takes time pain, yeah. to do it. It's a pain, and people, I think, avoid it because of that. Where, right. like, if you're going to have it automatic, like, it's just take it magically from my bank account. And we generated a question just like, oh, nice. No, I think Roger, you're all making such great points. I'm like, yeah. But, but Roger, your last point in regards to the newspapers and, and buying articles, because I think the newspapers are the ones that are struggling the most. Um, they're the ones that are going to sink first. Hollywood will be there, you know, the music industry. Um, but what about the fact that newspapers are asking us to pay for something that, it, they're asking us to pay for their content online, but they're taking away the very benefit of being online, just being able to share. I mean, I'm not on, I, when I read an article online, or if I love it, hate it, or whatever, I'm sending it to someone. I'm like, hey, this is, you know, this is awful. If I have to pay for that, and you're taking away the very thing that makes the internet, it's what it is. It's founded on the basis of sharing information. Why do I want it? You're, you're take, so, I mean, am, am I kind of accurate in that assessment that they're actually asking us to pay for something and then taking away the very benefit of it? Do you have an example of that? I mean, are you Example of paper that I, I know some oh, people yes. have walls. Yes, no, no, no. Oh. well, Newsday is okay, the right, right. But you guys have cable vision in Long Island anyway. I 
who write it online and write it, and they put up that paywall, and, 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 and you know, you have to pay for it, and of course you can't share it, because it's paid, you know, and no one wants to look at it. Either. So if I'm reading it, you, you're, ask, you're actually um, putting me back in a hole that we were in, you know, 20 years ago, which is the media being a very kind of singular, one-person experience. Um, why would I pay more, or why would I pay for something when you're taking away the benefit of the well, you're not. You know, you're not. I don't, I don't think that you are. Question was directed. I, I don't think like, it's, it's a dumb model. It's not going to exist. And to that point, about three or four, no, about three or four months ago, after they put up the paywall, they, they their subscription, hoping that they get more. Five thousand dollars. That's all they paid for. Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars. It cost them more just to put up the wall. Right. Well, the General Enquirer is still doing that to this day. Right. And that's why I wanted to cross post that stuff on my left nut right. because I'm like, I can't read your article, forget them. Right. But you know what? They, they, now they've gotten around it. Doug Hardy, who, who I consider a friend, they're on Facebook. You can read yeah. the JI on Facebook. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or the legislators from Twitter. Right. All the people are complaining, complaining they can't reach their legislators, yet you sign up to their, to their uh, feed and you can see in real time that they're tweeting at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. It's an instant direct contact, and it's decentralized now. Right, so I, they need to use the same model as like a blogger or as a musician, which is give to get, you know, so give, give away our stories and maybe there's something, you know, bigger behind it. I mean, like the New York Times has created this brand and now anything, you know, with the New York Times is associated with quality, you know, with, with you know, uh, legitimacy, legitimacy etc. So, you know, they could probably go down a whole other road of, and they've done it with like you know the New York Times presents and Times Select and stuff like that. And so you know utilizing that brand is is key. I mean that brand is priceless. So but there, again a lot of these people you know at least in New York Times it's it's quarter to quarter. We got to make our earnings this and that. So there's also targeted ad advertising as well. Like for instance on an iPhone or an iPad or certain PCs you can t you can know exactly when you log online where you're located at and based upon where you're located at they'll put up certain ads. On your on your website, like sometimes I go to the Huffington Post, I'm like, wow, why isn't that what my and the damn Malloy ad opens? They don't understand. It's kind they of know where you are. They, they know where you're at, yeah. and that's a big benefit because now you can have ads targeted to certain sites. Well, well, I think go. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I think that's how they'll make their money now. Right. You know, it's not going to be any more from charging us. It can't be, you know, because we're not willing to pay. But advertisers are definitely willing to pay to get our attention. Perfect segue to what I want to, one of the points I want to make sure that we touched on before we got out of here. Uh, on the social media, they know where you are. It, you know, especially you'll see these stories on Main Street. I, I watched my newscast last night and one of the top stories, Facebook privacy settings. I'm wondering, were you offended or is anybody offended when you see these targeted ads and they, you figured out, okay, they know who I am. I don't know how they know who I am, where I am, my geolocation. Same thing with Facebook. I'm a, I'm gonna make an assumption that if you're on social media, you know your stuff is out there. I mean, and people who spend a lot of time trying to wall it off, it's like you don't need to be on social media, social media. You know, I mean, I think, am I wrong in, in making that assessment, or is that <laughs> going to be a problem moving forward uh, on, on these platforms, on these social media platforms, where your pri your privacy is, is is out there, or if it's privacy, or the the marketers, so we can get this stuff for free. You know. You need to be searchable. That's one thing we have to search, you know, after interactivity, search is the king of the web. You go on the web looking for stuff, right? And so you have to search. And so the marketers want to, you know, who has Gmail? I mean, we all have accepted the fact that when you open up your Gmail, there are ads targeted to the stuff that you're talking mm -hmm. about, with maybe personal, intimate conversations. Yeah, I, I think, though, that it might be a matter of who governs the internet. You know, so that, that is a real problem with our privacy. I mean, if we're not protected, I mean, there are no laws saying, you know, that you can and can't do anything. I mean, pretty much, so, it's pretty much the book. The talk I did this afternoon, and I think the big difference is, is you know if you put your pictures of your family up, someone at Facebook could get in and see it if they had to, but the whole world can. I think that's pretty much the level of expectation that I like about Facebook because I can have pictures of my kids on there and unless you're my friend, you can't see it. Beyond that, come on, like, yeah, cops can get it if they really want to, but, uh, and you know, that's just how it is, right? But you know, the founder of Facebook, not the founder, the, one of the, the, one of the, the gentlemen who actually ran privacy at Facebook, who's not there anymore, he made a statement this week, and he basically said that they are pushing 
the envelope way too far with privacy. I don't know if he's a disgruntled former employee, <laughs> but uh, but he ran it. I mean, he, he said, because for everything that Facebook uh, or a platform like Facebook does in the media in terms of announcing um, privacy issues that they're, you know, there's a whole lot more being done behind the scene that we're not privy to that we probably would have a problem with. So to take them at their face value is, I think, But I think it's, it all starts with us. When you, sure. put, when you put information, because I, I do, no, I I do a lot of Facebook yeah. back-end analytics stuff, and right. stuff that people put out there. Right. You know, when I think people, it's 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 social. I mean, sure. so sure. it's that's what you do. And right. if you have a concern with that, you should. should no, I agree. But, but there's a lot of things that are going on that even you would be surprised about. And you would be surprised to know that you would be upset about if you knew what was happening with your identity. If you knew. If well, you if knew. I, but, you know, I think for me, I wouldn't. I, I, if, what I put out there is, right. is what I put out there. I mean, right. But but how that information and, and is used is the issue, isn't but, it? How but it's used. The same. The same. Concept. What if they gave it to porn and just, what if the, what if it fell into the hands of the porn and if I began to contact you, know, you if, and your if children? I put, if I put my information, I'm. And you're responsible for it. I'm responsible. But you wouldn't be happy with that. You wouldn't I'm, be happy with with I'm, the top ten porn companies in this country contacting you and your family. And putting so, and getting, I'm just well, being, but, I'm being, but, but, the, yeah, right. but, but, yeah, but I think also, but then it comes back to the pushback that's going right. to, to uh, ensue because of something right. like that. I, mean, right. I think that's what, what you have to, you know, we can go to, to the extremes on, mm -hmm. on anything, but I think when you sign up for Facebook mm -hmm. and a lot of the information, and so if you then become a fan of one of my pages, mm -hmm. I'm looking at that, I'm seeing it. And you know what? Sometimes you might want the information that I have. Sometimes, you know, I mean, when spam, you know, they instituted certain laws, you know, to kind of reduce spam, we still get it, whatever. But, you know, that was a response to something that went over over the top. But even just basic email, that's why when people get upset about the uh, social uh, social media kind of stuff, it's basic email. If I send you an email, keep it private. Don't tell anybody. You know, it's out there. It, it, it's out there. Uh -oh. Oh. Right. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think something, though, that, that we need to, like, think about is that there's two different things. One of them is... You know these trusted sources like Facebook, like Google, like you know these are companies, you know huge companies, hopefully that have that have privacy, you know standards in place where we are giving them a lot of information. You know knowing what you're searching for can tell me a lot of information, right? Hey, I'm looking for a car. Probably means that you're you're in the market for a car, or Finance. you know, hey, I have you know <laughs> if you're googling tuberculosis, you probably have tuberculosis or you know remedy for t TB, whatever. We know a lot about you, and hopefully these companies we trust that you know, they have actually people that are in charge of privacy, and that's uh, hopefully a good thing. I think the other way to look at it is there's so much information out there that what's available on the public public internet, right? So in your example, I wanted to find your kids. You know, I could probably Google them, and maybe there's a photo somewhere that you can't help because somebody tagged them in Facebook, and now it shows up, and you can't help them. So it, it, a funny story is a friend of mine is paranoid about that second fact. And so now he tags everything with his name, right? So that water bottle is him, that Izzy is him, that thing is him, this table is him, this sneaker is him. And so now you have too much information that it's useless. And so I think that there's two different ways to look at it because hopefully we can trust the Facebooks, Googles, and you know other companies like that of the world because if we can't, then, then we're in trouble versus the public internet where you know, hopefully there there's some things that, that you can manipulate. But it all comes down to the individual, it all comes down upon you. If you don't want that stuff out there, then don't put it out there yourself because it's coming from you in the first place. That's where you got the people who put inappropriate stuff on videotape and they go, Oh my god, it's good to speak. But but, but but if I tag if I tagged you, let's say you're let's say, you know, we were downstairs in the basement, you're an Olympic swimmer and you smoke a bong and I tag you in Facebook and you're like, don't tag me, oh, too late, you. it's out there. And now you're Michael Zell. Maybe you shouldn't be smoking in the first place. Yeah. No, he's doing he was smoking. Well, if I was smoking it, it's my bad. You know, yeah, but that's your say. privacy, though, you know? It's, there is no, you got, you there have to is assume there is no privacy. There is that, it's Big Brother, I mean, it's, that's the terrible thing. I don't so one has to be smart, I think, how they go. But what about in the case, what about in the case where, I know someone who's just fired from Hallmark, he'd been there for like 20 years as a greeting card writer, and Hallmark went to, into his Facebook account and found some pictures and said, these pictures are inappropriate and uh, you're fired. They literally did that. Well, was that something that he posted publicly? No, well, it was on his Facebook page. It was public. Yeah, he must have had at least one friend at work. 
So could that friend have been the one that reported it? Well, even if he did, does Hallmark have a right to, or on the basis of your personal Facebook page? No, if your friend is the head Colleges of Hallmark. Colleges do that too. Yeah. That's a different, right? I mean. Yeah, they do. They do. They do. I think we're going to have to. To wrap this up, and uh, okay. it was a great, Thank great you. conversation, yeah. great discussion. Wow. I wish we had yeah. more time, um, yeah. and, and, but I'm glad we got it done, and uh, it's now been yeah. preserved. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Trouble for you guys <laughs> suggesting that <laughs> I watch porn on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.